Not so long ago, a gentleman from Warwickshire kindly lent me a lens that he described as his best worst lens. Having used the lens, I can see exactly what he means. The lens isn't the best performer in conventional terms of sharpness, contrast, colours and so on, but it produces crazy beautiful results in the right conditions. This got me thinking, of all the vintage lenses I've tried, what are my top five best worst lenses? I'm not talking about cheap old lenses that perform better than I thought they would. Some of the lenses on my list are not that cheap. And I'm not thinking about lenses that very occasionally produce stunning results because of an exceptional subject or composition. No, I'm thinking of lenses that are inherently fascinating, either in their design or because they're full of eye-catching distortions and odd effects. I'm going to count them down from 5 to 1. Starting at number 5, it's the Mare Optic Girl It's Domi Plan 50 f2.8. The lens is known for two things, its soap bubble bouquet and its poor bill quality, most noticeably a very dodgy aperture mechanism. I bought a copy where the seller said the aperture blades open and close accurately, and they did at first, but after a few months of using the lens, the mechanism started to act up. I sometimes have to give the lens a tap on the side to get the blades to move into their correct position, sometimes a stronger hit. The main problem is that the blades don't always open all the way, as you can see here. The bouquet balls should be round towards the centre of the image, but they're not. And this is infuriating, as it's a lens you really want to use wide open. Stop down, the lens performs well. It's not a dog, so I'm loath to open it up and take out the blades completely. If and when you get the blades wide open, the lens is a fascinating performer. It can produce bubble bouquet in all its soapy glory, with lines around the rims of the bouquet balls. The bubbles aren't very large, as you can't focus very closely with the lens, but they're certainly there. And you can always get closer in using extension tubes. The soap bubble look, in case you're wondering, is created by the lens's triplet design, a simple design that doesn't deal with out-of-focus highlights very sympathetically. Lenses with better optical designs produce smoother, less intrusive, blurred highlights. I say better designs, except that in this modern era, when you're bored with digitally computational perfection, this cruder kind of effect can be rather popular, and this is one of the defining features of a best worst lens. The lens's soapy bubbles are not as dramatic as one of the other lenses on my list that we'll see later. And I should point out that many other old Fast 50s can blow a lot of bubbles in the right conditions. Take this snap from an early 8-element Super Takuma 50 f1.4, not a lens well known as a bubble monster. The difference with the Domi plan are those clear lines around the bubbles. And number 4 is a Tier 3S, a 300mm f4.5 lens with an impressive 16 aperture blades. Now, if you've never seen this lens before, you're in for a surprise. And if you have seen it before, well, if you're anything like me, I never get bored of seeing it again. Here it is, attached, as it was originally designed, to a Zenit camera, with this shotgun arrangement, also known as a photo sniper. You pull the gun's trigger to shoot a photo. That's shoot a photo, not your subject. It isn't a bad lens at all. In fact, it's rather good. But it's the badass setup that really gets it into my top five. It's not a setup I'd feel remotely comfortable walking around town with anymore. And here it is dominating my Pentax K01, a camera that could legitimately be described as my best worst digital mirrorless camera. A design that brought howls of derision, unfairly I feel. It's a pig to use without a viewfinder, but a great Sony sensor tweaked by Pentax. The lens has a focusing wheel that I thought was very odd, even bizarre, but that was before I started using it. Then I realized it's a great way to focus. And it has this rustic rubber hood. It looks and feels like a rubber plunger, the kind we use to unblock toilets. Optically, for its age, the lens delivers excellent results as long as you stabilize it properly. It's very sharp stop down. And it produces lovely bouquet wide open. Overall, a beautiful beast. At number three, in stark contrast to the beast, is this small jewel of a lens, a super multi-coated fisheye Takuma 17mm f4. It's a gorgeously engineered lens, with three built-in filters, which you apply by moving this ring. I use each of these filters at different times, depending on the light and contrast and so on. It's a really intelligent, neat arrangement, Intel inside. Now the thing about fisheyes is that they really shine on bright sunny days, and with the fisheye coverage, you'll be including a lot of sky in your compositions outdoors. 
When you do that, it's highly likely that the sun will be in the frame, which for many fish eyes, especially modern fish eyes, can be a good thing, an artistic opportunity to play with sunbursts. Here's an example taken with a fish eye 10 to 17 mm zoom, a lens with great coatings that produces very well controlled sunbursts, and a 4 mm circular fish eye, where the sun is coming through the edge of the frame and the rest of the image is just about clean of flare. The super multi coated fisheye Takuma, as the name proudly announces, is multi coated, and the people who made these lenses were pretty advanced in terms of coatings in the mid 1970s. You might think the lens handles the sun quite well, but you'd be wrong. No matter how many super coatings it has, this lens flares like a monster when it's pointed at the sun. And by monster flares, I mean large shapes and artifacts that spread across the frame. I actually enjoy playing with these effects but there's no escaping how bold and intrusive they are. It's a classic example of a fine vintage lens that is not nearly as good as modern lenses with their advanced designs, glass and coating technology, but still it has a charm and appeal all of its own. And number two, this choice is not going to shock you. It's the ubiquitous Helios 44-2 a lens produced in huge numbers and justifiably one of the most popular old lenses for digital cameras. This one was made at the JOV factory in 1975. Some people say that this factory had lower quality control than other Helios factories, but who really knows lens by lens? One of the key reasons, perhaps the key reason, for the 44-2's popularity is how the lens distorts out-of-focus highlights when it's wide open, giving the background a swirly look as long as the conditions are right. This isn't some deliberate magical effect dialed in by the lens designers. This is distortion, and not very good distortion. Not at all good compared to other lenses with much less distortion. But as we've already seen, yesterday's poor optical performance is today's trendy look, and the swirly results are very much sought after by many photographers and videographers. I was going to say amateurs here, but that would be patronising, as I've seen these kinds of swirly backgrounds in professional productions too. So this is my number two choice as the best worst lens, and it richly deserves the accolade for giving so many people so much fun and so much frustration when the swirls don't appear automatically. By the way, I could have chosen the 44-2 or any of its siblings. By the time you get to the Helios 44 M7, you're getting into the territory of a very good all-round lens with good coatings and colours, but it still swirls wide open. What clinches the Helios 42 version for me is how loose the clickless aperture ring is, how it wobbles on my M42 adapter, and how stiff the focus is. It just doesn't feel very good, and it doesn't always smell very nice either. However, I can forgive all this for the occasions it delivers its outrageous swirls. And at number one, I'm nominating the lens that Warwickshire Wanderer kindly lent me and gave me the idea for this video. It's the Mare Optic Gurlitz Primatar 135mm f3.5. The copy I tried was an M42 mount version. It also comes in an exact amount. It has 15 aperture blades, 4 elements in 3 groups, which is a tester design, and a minimum focusing distance of one6 meters. It's a lens to compare with the much-hyped, some people say over-hyped, Trio Plan 100mm, and it actually compares very well. The Trio Plan is undoubtedly a strong candidate for a best worst lens, capable of magical beauty, with soap bubble bouquet that's not too dissimilar to the Primata, but it costs around three times as much as the Primata, and because the Trio Plan is not a lens I've used personally, it's not on my list. Back to the Primata. In terms of its performance, I've read that some owners struggle to get sharp images with the lens wide open, and you don't want to pixel peep with this lens, but it's not unusably soft wide open if you nail the focus. Stop down, the lens I borrowed isn't the sharpest or cleanest performer I've used relative to other well-regarded 135mm lenses. All those blades do make a difference to smooth out blurred highlights. However, with the copy I tried, it shows a kind of slightly hazy glow to the images stop down. It's said that it was hard for manufacturers to produce a poor 135mm lens in the film era, but this lens is getting close to winning that dubious elusive prize if you primarily want to use the lens stop down. Even with a decent, deep hood, the lens doesn't like too much light coming in when it's stopped down, as this image shows, and there are a lot of light leaks. 
As you move the lens to wide open, the images become much more interesting. And this is where a not very good 135mm lens, relative to other lenses, really starts to grab your attention. As the saying goes, a picture tells a thousand words, so I'm going to show you a few pictures from the lens wide open, without blabbering on. If I had to define the archetypal, eccentric soap bubble bouquet look, then this lens produces it. It's as if somebody has drawn a line around each bubble to make sure you know it's there, and I process the images to accentuate their impact. Whether you like it or not, this look is much more pronounced than the smoother bubble bouquet produced by many other vintage lenses, and because I think it all looks rather gorgeous rather than simply crazy, I'm nominating the Primata as the best worst lens I've ever used. So that's my top five. I know there are other best worst lenses out there. I could have listed a lot more, not just conventional camera lenses, but also projector and cine lenses. However, I'd rather hear from you about your own personal best worst lenses. Lenses that you've grown to love for their eccentricities. Lenses that produce images full of character. And I'm looking forward to reading all about them. So until the next time, please like and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And all the best.